Hi everyone, we're in uh, Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. It was a project I worked with uh, Jeff Epping on to plant a meadow we did last year. We planted about 17, 18,000 perennials in two and a half inch containers last July and early August. And this uh, October, we're back doing the bulb layer, the initial bulb layer. We're planting probably, uh, I think around eight to 9,000 bulbs today, mostly narcissus and alliums. And we have to put uh, bulbs in the deer and small creatures, rabbits, voles, and mice aren't going to bother. And you probably have a lot of questions about bulbs. I think one of the commonly asked questions to me is, do I have to replace my bulbs every year? And I said, no, you don't. None of these bulbs are gonna get replaced every year that we're putting in uh, right now. The reason you may think that is because a lot of the tulips that are hybridized to entertain you, it's like all about me, look at me, it's all about me, tulips. They are short-lived short because they don't have enough time in our area to reproduce the flower within the bulb for the following year. So they steadily decline and have to continuously be replaced, which the people in Holland love. And they love the fact you think you have to replace your bulbs every year. So they're very joyful about the fact that that's something you totally uh, believe in. But the bulbs we're putting in, I got some Allium azurium in my pocket. This Allium will be here and it will be in this garden when the next generation of people move into this home and the following generation of people move into this home, the Allium Azurium will still be here living a life with perennials uh, within the garden. So what we're using today, we're putting in a Narcissus Tetetet, Herrera, Quail, and Thalia, and a few Mount Hood within the Panicums. And basically we're doing two styles of planting to begin with. We're doing a river, of Narcissus and the river of Narcissus the planning is we drift say tete-a-tete -tete, through the garden possibly on an angle I go on an angle and also parallel to, to the edge of the bed but three feet off the edge within the garden you don't want to put bulbs on the edge of the garden because that looks messy but with the river we put five seven three ten and we keep them each grouping we keep two to three feet apart maybe five feet apart kind of like islands in a chain of islands and the space between them helps define the drift of the narcissus or daffodils. And then we extend that river more emotionally to where we believe it should stop. And we incorporate them uh, in different rhythms and different patterns and bloom times. Like the tete -tet has a different bloom time than Herrera, Narcissus Herrera does. And then we have statement Narcissus. We put three to five in a hole, like I'll take jet fire. We put three, three to five in a hole and it might be in one group of perennials, say like Menarda Bradburiana. And we'll put three here, five, three, seven, and we would keep those each grouping two to six feet apart so it's scattered like they seeded in. So we're starting with rivers of Narcissus and statements of Narcissus. Then the Allium Azurium I showed you, I put that everywhere. Right now I'm going through Schizacrium and Sporobolus plantings and that'll have beautiful blue golf balls it'll look like in June. And a lot of people think the grass is in bloom. They go, where, do you, where can I get that grass that's blooming with those blue flowers? They say, well, that's the grass planted with onions. It's the onion that's flowering. So it, it can mislead people, but then it's exciting because now we have to look, people are thinking about a social system of planting. And that's always the key, is how to interact the bulbs and the perennials together in a social way so they enhance each other. And what the sprobolus is going to do, and the schizacrium, it's gonna hide the lower foliage of the allium when they flower because the older, lower foliage of allium azurium turns brown. If I had it in a pot in a bench in our retail area, people would never buy it because they would think there's a problem with that plant, the lower foliage is brown. And that's actually, that's the way the plant lives. It can't help itself. It doesn't know it's disturbing the thoughts of humans. It has no intention to do that. It's just the nature of the plant. And that way, again, the sprobolus will hide that and you'll have the beautiful blue flowers above. So we'll take a look at some of the plantings and we're using a drill. We have a drill with a five inch bit. We kind of wiggle it around because we want to make sure we don't plant everything in a circle. So we put four in here, we make another hole, put three next to it. So we have everything kind of offset as if they seeded in. So we don't want, you don't want to see a circle of bulbs in the spring when you walk through the garden. 
but the drill helps us get the soil broke up and put the soil back on top of the bulbs. And usually for measuring, I have a simple way of measuring, I would grab the, and I'll show this to you, I grab the narcissus at the tip and I put it about an inch, I'll just below the soil up to an inch above my knuckles. And that helps me get them at a proper depth and they'll bloom roughly about the same time. So that's what we're doing right now. If you have any more questions, I'd be happy to, to share thoughts with you. So let's take a look at the planting and, and meet some of my staff doing the planting. It's a beautiful day here too. We're having a great time. Thanks everybody. I'm back everyone and I want to introduce you to Adam and Mike. Mike, you've already met on the YouTube station. He's done some uh, good gardening demonstrations and programs, but I want you to meet Adam. Hi he's, there. Going, he's going to be the gardener here, or the steward. So share a little bit about how you got here. Um, well, I had been asked to come to do this project here a few years back. Uh, I planted a bunch of hardwood uh, trees and shrubs, a bunch of native uh, woodland planting uh, up on the hillside on the adjacent uh, part of the property. And that was with Jeff Epping. Yep, I did that with uh, Jeff Epping. And then um, when we did the planting here last year, I got hired to uh, come in, water it all, and keep it alive. Um, and then this year I ended up taking over all the weeding and maintenance for pretty much the entire property here. So, And did a good job. It's, he uh, was persistent and caring and I think passionate and that's a big plus to enjoy. It's, it's not bad in life to enjoy what you do, I don't think. And Adam and Mike, say, and Mike's here drilling in bulbs, so Mike, just, just explain a little bit about your So your I've been bulbs. here to help fill in all the holes that were occurring because as we know not everything will survive and so my job has been following Roy's footsteps and creating drifts of plantings throughout the patches that were open. And he's done a great job too. I think it's all we're all still learning. We're all the constant interns and I tell people I think when I hit 92 I might be unstoppable. So look out world when I get there. We're gonna help him get there for sure. Make it. These guys are terrific. This is our future in gardening and we are going to be a gardening nation. We're getting rid of yard work. Well, a lot of people have questions about, geez, Roy, when we look at some of your plantings, like I just got back from Detroit. As a matter of fact, next week I'm going back to Detroit. Austin's there right now laying bulbs out. I'm going back next week to lay another five or 6,000 bulbs out in Detroit. Your gardens that you look at, either peed out off of the one you've just done here in Mount Horb, they're very big. They're very large. We don't have large spaces. Well, I said, you can take the 20,000 square feet. We can look at 120 square feet right here. And we can see how we can lay the bulbs out in an area maybe 120 feet or even less. It could be 100 to 50 square feet. Size is, is just the relationship you're working with. And you can downsize. You can break a 20,000 square foot garden to 100 square feet. And we could look at using the same bulbs, the tete a tete And we could space them through the plantings, based again on the relationship with the plantings. And in this little area right here, as you see, there's a salvia and calamaris and spirobolis. So if we take 150 square feet, we're just going to be adding dahlias in groups of three to five through this bed. And then I'm going to put the uh, allium missourium going into the spirobolis and the calamaris. And I can do that in 120 or so square feet. So again, it's not you're not limited by size, either big or small. What, what usually limits us is our thoughtful imagination and being uh, more creative and not, say, not creating a story that I can't do it. Sometimes that's what gets in our way. We create something, I can't do that, I don't have enough of this or enough of that. It's all available and all ready to do. And sometimes what helps too, I know the best thing I've ever done is screw up everything. When I make mistakes and screw up things, that's how I learn. And, it, and I, don't, I don't try to make the same mistake again but I learned by the volume of plants. And then what I do, guess what? I just move them. So if you see something you don't like, you dig it out and move it, and you keep learning and growing with the garden. So it's, it's your growth and your intimate relationship with the plants as they grow together with you. It's learning and having fun. I'll see you later. So the next question is, what's the future? Uh, the future, first, it always starts with good stewardship and a thoughtful approach to the next year. And that next year is going to begin by everything you see here will be cut back with mulching mowers. We're going to cut everything next year with a, a mulching mower over it three to five times. We're going to leave all the plant debris here 
And Anna Marie is always asking me if you have any suggestions. I have to come up with a better word either than debris or plant rubbish. She thinks there's got to be a positive uh, phrase I can use. So anyone out there, let me know if you have some positive phrases for plant debris and leaving debris in the garden. But that's what we're doing. So all the plants will live in their own litter and they'll be healthy as can be. That's their mulch. Where it's a, people say, well, you don't mulch. I said, yes, well, you let the plants live in their own litter and their own debris. That's their mulch for time eternal. That's what they're going to live in. And then we do it in March prior to the uh, bulbs emerging. So we have a window of about four to five weeks before the bulbs emerge, maybe six weeks, depending on the weather. And then, uh, again, we'll leave the litter and the, the customer, the clients here are actually excited about that, which is cool. And, and then after that, we watch the emergence of the bulbs. We'll document the bulbs with uh, our cell phone so we know where we need to add and enhance the following fall when we do our second layer of bulbs. That's very important. And then after, after that, it's uh, using the Dutch push pull hole to start weeding around mid-April, again, depending on weather. And with the Dutch push pull hole, we'll be out here every two weeks, or I won't, Adam will be. Ooh, he's in the panicum back there planting uh, alliums. So he'll be out here with his Dutch push pull hole, and he'll be hoeing about a, a two week schedule all the way till mid to late June, as long as he can get in the garden. And again, we hoe about uh, 1,000 square feet in 75 to 85 minutes. So by the number of 1,000 square feet, we got about 17,000 square feet, 16,000. That'll give us an indication of how much time is needed to do the hoeing as, as we come out to maintain and care for the gardens. So and it's a lot of fun because we have a modest plan in place. And then the rest of it is field adaptability and making decisions based on uh, what happens. Like here we had deer eating the sedums, so we're going to have to replace the sedums. They didn't eat everything, but if they eat this one area, we're probably going to fix this and take all the sedums out and replace it with uh, some other plants. And usually that's a, a trial. And when, when I do designs, uh, you try maybe 5% of something that you might not think will work because you never know. I know when Pete Outloff designed the uh, Lurie Garden in Millennium Park, he tried Oringium borgetii. I've never gotten that to grow at, at all in our heavy clay soils. Well, the well-drained soils that were found along the Kankakee River that were used at Millennium Park, Eurynchium borgetii, it actually had a good quality of life for, for an, an extended period of time. So you don't really know each site is its own system and its own way of being. So you can't assume one thing that hasn't worked somewhere is not going to work in another location. So it's always that redefining how we approach something. So I'm always doing it. I'm always recreating myself and trying to find what's the next me and the next garden adventure. So this is its own place, its own world, and its own system of being. And that's how we're going to look at it, enjoy it, and share it with others like you. So again, if you have questions, give me a call, and I'll be happy to communicate as best I can and share your thoughts with you. See you next time.